Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to the Armor of Faith, show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ builds upon Peter. And I'm joined today by my panel, which includes my lovely wife, Sharon, as well as uh, Helen Hopkins and Sister Sarah Draney. And Sister Sarah Draney is a Dominican nun from the Monastery of the Infant Jesus in Lufkin, Texas. Helen is a lay Dominican and has a love for music ministry. The Dominicans, I should mention, are also known as the Order of Preachers, so it fits very well with our format here today. Sharon is still our token cradle Catholic, and as everyone knows by now, I'm simply here to ask questions because through questions, I have an opportunity to learn, and boy, do I have a lot to learn. So to answer my questions and expand my knowledge is why we have our panelists, so welcome to our panelists as well as to our listeners. Let us open with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, amen. So last time, we discussed our call to ministry to others. As we mentioned, ministry is service to others uh, by one who serves. So we're called to serve according to the two great commandments. Uh, For as we minister to others, we fulfill the second of the greatest commandments, And in so doing, we also demonstrate respect for our Creator as we endeavor to do His will. Our work and service to others, then, is also service to Him in respect and love of His creation. We also discussed a number of excuses we might have for avoiding ministry, but if we're honest and believe God is with us, we have no excuse to withhold ourselves from ministry. Of course, we're tempted to be timid and hide behind waiting for someone to ask us if we would help. Rather than hiding, we should take inventory of ourselves and offer our time and talent where we believe they might be of use. If we are uncertain or unsure of our talents, then we can ask in prayer for God to help us to see the gifts and talents he has placed within our stewardship and the purpose to which he desires we should put them so that his will may be done. Of course, we must understand our efforts in ministry will not buy us a seat in heaven. That was purchased for us from upon the cross. Our response to the call to ministry is simply a demonstration of our belief in our Lord and Savior. For if we believe in him, then what we do demonstrates the nature of our belief. Should Jesus ask us if we believe in him, hopefully we will say yes. But our endeavors in ministry will help answer the possible follow-up question from Jesus, which might be, And how would I know? If we truly love him, we will respond to his call. Then we'll ask about a special, or we'll talk about a special ministry. I'm the one to do the asking. So today we'll talk about a special ministry, and that is family. The word family is not exactly easy to define. Well, friends Merriam-Webster incorporate eight different segments in their definition of family. But the top of the list is the following. The family is the basic unit in society, traditionally consisting of two parents rearing their children. Also, any of various social units differing from, but regarded as equivalent to, the traditional family, such as a single parent family. So when we think of family, we all have different experiences. So what are some of the things we might think about when we use the term family, and and are they all positive thoughts? Well, for me, uh, family is a positive thought. I I know that um, my family has been a very loving family, but I've also been a foster parent. And I am acutely aware of families who, who, and children who do not experience positive family interactions. So, but they still remain families. Uh, One of the things I learned as a foster parent is how closely knit even abused children are 
to their biological parents and their biological families. So uh, it, there's positives and there's negatives in the word family. I think it brings to mind for me the fact that um, that man really is a social animal. Um, we all need each other in one way or the other. Uh, there's, I don't think anybody can be really happy just living a solitary existence all of their life. Um, um, I think it's a way, even if we experience... Um, bad people in our in our world and in our families. It's still an opportunity to enhance um, our own strength, our own understanding. Um, so even if we experience bad families, we can continue uh, to learn from that to see what uh, God is trying to show us about that and to actually go out and make a difference in ourselves and in other people's lives that might lead us to um, volunteer with abused children or other uh, ministries. So it just calls to mind the interdependence that we have on each other. Uh, And then, from my vantage, I think everywhere I go, whatever I get involved in, I want to make sense, whether it's been a home Courtroom, or it's been Hail Haven, or it's been our classes that we teach. Um, for me, every time you get a group of people together, you're building family. The family is not just mom, dad, and the kids. The family is classes. The family is the people you volunteer with. Fam, you know, the, the soup kitchen, the kitchen people, yeah. things like that. I, I think yes. it's. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah. Well, Sharon, when I when I think of you and how you grew up as a military child uh, uh, and traveled and whatnot, you you personally have learned how to create family wherever you go, and the military has been a real positive uh, training for you in that. Um, you 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 have learned to quickly. Uh, surround yourself with people and think of them as family. That, that's very true. I can remember as a kid always coming home with my report card at the end of the, the, end of the last school day and coming home and there was a moving truck in front. And we, we moved every summer. So, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. You have to, you have, when, you're, when you're in a situation like that, you learn that when you get to the new place, you make friends fast and, and just as quickly as you can because in nine months you're going to be moving again. So, but, but irregardless of that part of it, um, I just think, I think that family is developed through interaction and through, um, you know, doing things together. And so that's why I think of our classes and soup kitchens and, um, you know, anything we volunteer in, anything we do becomes family because, you know, that's that's who we are, and and that's not just that's not just not for for military children. That happens throughout for everybody. Yeah, I think if we examine um, how we interact, going back to what Sarah said, uh, sister sister Sarah said, as far as uh, families uh, or being people being social animals, um, we have this innate desire inside of us to be part of the family. And that can also explain why some people, if they have a dysfunctional family, will turn to some sort of surrogate family um, for which they they are able to develop a relationship. Um, The family, we would hope, is a positive experience for everybody within the family. But as we we also know um, from from, uh, examining environments, uh, not all families are uh, are happy for a variety of reasons. It could be parents not living up to their responsibilities or children not living up to their responsibilities. Um, it could be outside influences that try to tear the family apart and influence it in different ways. 
So we look for harmony in the family, but sometimes we also find disharmony. And family, as it's formed out of a marriage, if you will, um, that it, that's, you know, that's where it starts is between a man and a woman as they come together in the sacrament of matrimony. Uh, and then they may add to the family as they have children uh, and as it grows. Um, we, we end up seeing that it is a ebb and flow of relationship, that sometimes relationships are good and sometimes relationships take a lot of work and sometimes relationships suffer. We also see experiences whereby um, through, through death or, or some other catastrophe, uh, a parent or a child is taken from a family. And we see that family then having to deal with that grief. Or we see children become orphans. Or we see um, uh, the partnership of parents disrupted where now it's only a single parent family uh, for a variety of reasons. We also see how the family nucleus that we talk about will extend itself and maybe include uh, others that are around them. You know, that, that phrase that you're family now, uh, or the second time somebody comes over to the house and says, well, you know, you're family, you know, I can just go ahead and take them to the you know, we're not going to serve you anymore. Um, so that, that type of thing, when you get close in your relationships and you get that level of familiarity. We talk about also things like parish families. And this is where we look for the whole parish to get along. But it also is a matter of individual uh, and group relationships. And then ultimately, we start talking about the human family. Because if, if we're honest, um, we're all children of God's creation. So when Jesus tells us we have but one Father in heaven, that's the Heavenly Father, then we all are part of that family. Uh, and then, of course, when we start thinking, too, about our relationship with Christ, and as we become part of the body of Christ, we also become part of the family. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later uh, here as we go on within the show. But I'd like to start with um, Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. It's amazing how I always seem to go back close to the beginning. Um, it says, The man gave names to all the tame animals, all the birds of the air, and all the wild animals. But none proved to be a helper suited to the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built the rib that he had taken from the man into a woman. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one should be called woman, for out of man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two of them become one body. So kind of as we examine this particular scripture here, uh, we see that, that first relationship between man and woman, between Adam and Eve. So as we go back to the beginning, we see God created Adam, but so the man would not be alone, God also created Eve. Given there are only two at this point, what is interesting about this segment of scripture, and what does it foreshadow? It, it it foreshadows the, the to what I think of as the traditional family, and uh, the traditional family has always been kind of shaky in 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 its relationships. But back again to some of my experiences as a foster parent, the one thing I learned and was really brought home to me was that no matter what kind of family you can create or what kind of uh, uh, friendships and whatnot you can create within your home, no matter how much love, a child will always long for his or her biological parent and parents. No matter, even, uh, uh, even after accepting the behavior recognizing that, that it cannot be, there is a longing in all of our hearts to, to uh, it, it become part of that almost mystical concept of my mom, my dad, and me. 
and um and I speak from my own experience, but I also ex- speak from my experience with children who have have to come to accept that this is not a reality. But the longing is still always there. Yeah, I think one of the things that we uh, see here when we see um, Adam's response or, or actually when, when we see that God, what God notices, uh, none proved to be a helper suited to the man. So it was kind of like, well, man was alone, but God designed him for a different purpose. It, he designed him to be a social creature. And so here he is alone with all the animals, and probably the dog is the closest one to, to the affinity to the man. I don't know if, you know, if we think about current day relationships with, with pets. Um, but it's still, I mean, it wasn't somebody he could talk to, confide in, um, use his intelligence with, uh, share the day with, you know, all, a whole variety of things. You know, there's a lot of things you can do with a dog, but you're just not going to reach that, that same level of satisfaction uh, by having another person as you um, by which you can partner with and work together. So... God creates uh, this other human being, Eve, not exactly the same as a man, but complementary. If you look at it, um, the, the way our biology is, is that we're not complete without each other. In other words, we can't procreate. Um, there, and, and then you also look at, at how we're, we're drawn together. And so... Here, remember, this is in chapter 2. This is before chapter 3 where the serpents came and tempted Eve in the garden. And yet we're told here, this is why a man leaves his father and his mother at the, at the very beginning. So there was a foreshadowing here that this is what was intended, is, is that man and woman would be together, that they would have a partnership in life. Um, and then also the whole point of father and mother implies children. So we can make an assumption here that that it wasn't um, it wasn't the disobedience in the garden that brought forth children. God may have had that intention and design from the very beginning, and actually intends all of us to uh, obey His ways, to to follow His ways. And then we see this man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. So, we, again, we see this foreshadowing of what matrimony is to be. Um, so that as we come up with the experience, whether we align with Adam or we align with Eve, that we end up coming to cling to one another. It's such that they become one body. They become complete. And then in that completeness, they also generate children. Something for us to, to think about when we look back here at the beginning of what this, what this tells us, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. God meant a partnership for us. And we'll talk about a little bit about what that partnership means. So now also, I, I probably should have included another piece of scripture much later on in here that talks about that this is really only one calling. We talk about vocations. Not all men and not all women are called to be part of matrimony. In other words, there's different vocations. We have the vocations of the the priesthood, the religious life, and the single life. And so, you know, this this should be meant that, well, all men have to go and and find a, a wife because we talk about that later in the New Testament where we reflect upon the fact that not all are called. But if you are called then you have responsibilities to whatever location that you're called to. So let's look at Genesis chapter 4, verses uh, 1 to, um, I think it was 10. The man had intercourse with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, saying, I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. Next she gave birth to his brother Abel, and became a herder of, Abel became a herder of flocks, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground, while Abel, for his part, 
brought the fatty portion of the firstlings of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel in his offering, but on Cain in his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and dejected. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why are you dejected? If you act rightly, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies in wait at the door. Its urge is for you, yet you can rule over it. So Cain said to his brother Abel, Let us go out in the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? God then said, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So in essence, we see the formation of the first family through which all other families would spawn. What might we observe in this short story as a family grows from the man and woman God has brought together? Well, I think that, uh, first of all, it shows that um, that life in the family is not necessarily going to be perfect because there's going to be challenges sometimes. And um, But the idea is that Adam and, and Eve are supposed to, at the same time, train their children to... Um, uh, follow the laws of God, and um, that's pretty much your vocation as parents is to do that. And so hopefully that will not uh, um, lead children astray, but at the same time, your children have free will and things must happen. So I think it's a very realistic look at the uh, family rather than more of an idealized. You know, we see the first family and the first family too. <laughs> but if we if we go back to the beginning, one of the things that that strikes me is I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. Well, she didn't stop with I produced a male child. It was all me. It was I produced a male child with the help of the Lord, and so. We, we should probably think about what that, what that means in terms of procreation. This is that our creation comes at um, really the discretion of the Lord. He's our creator, and he's also the one that allows all things to happen. So I, that, that's the first thing that strikes me uh, there within this scripture. Another thing that strikes me, is that when we start talking about uh, how Abel and Cain came to bring their offerings to God, as we read this, we, we originally might think, well, geez, maybe maybe it was you know God just happened to like fatty portions before, and he didn't really like fruits and vegetables or vegetables or whatever it was that that Cain was tilling from the ground. And I think that's maybe missing the point because if we look at God's reaction to Cain. And he said, why are you angry and why are you dejected? His response wasn't, grow me better vegetables. His response was, if you act rightly. So it may have been not so much the, the offering, it may have been the way that, in which it was offered. I'm just speculating here, don't really, um, you know, don't really have anything there. But I'm just looking at that, that response from God, if you act rightly, then you will be accepted. And actually, if you go into the wording of it, that you will be accepted, an alternative to that is you will be lifted up, if you will. In other words, self-lifting. Uh, in other words, your, your acceptance by others is within your control. It's a self, self-lifting, self doing the right thing, doing what is right and just. And so I find that interesting that that was his response. It wasn't the nature of the offering. It was the action associated with the offering. This is what I see and interpret there. Well, Doug, I, I believe that you're right in this. There are, in the Psalms, it speaks about coming to God with a pure and clean and humble heart and then, your, uh, then offer your holocaust to God and he will accept it. Uh, it, it uh, 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 an offering made without the the love in your heart or 
without uh, the humility is what is wrong with this particular I agree with you, agree with you and if that is what was wrong it wasn't offered out of uh, a humble heart yeah and then you kind of you, you see this carry its way out so God restores it says if you act rightly you'll be accepted but if not he also warns sin lies in wait at the door its urge is for you yet you can rule over it however well we see what Cain did instead of improving himself and therefore lifting him up himself up in the eyes of God he takes it out on his brother Abel and and looks at it as a um, what is what's the, the, the word I'm uh, looking for when you're kind of in conflict with someone else uh, you see them as a rival instead of seeing his brother as his brother where they could work together on something he saw him as a rival because he was envious of the favor of God and so eh, let's remove the rivalry let's just you know get so in other words it wasn't a very good or positive response here God was telling him you, it's within your control. You can lift yourself up to that acceptance if you act rightly, if you act rightly. And unfortunately, Cain, Cain mis- either misunderstood, uh, didn't take that as gospel, uh, I, you know, I don't know, but it went wrong. And there we then see a dysfunction within the family. Um, so remember when I first said I, I talked there at the beginning about I have produced a male child with the help of the Lord. If we look at Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I dedicated you. A prophet to the nations, I appointed you. Now, of course, he was talking about Jeremiah here, but if we take both of these together, we see that basically, yes, it is with the help of the Lord. Because God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So God allowed that conception within Eve's womb, and she knew it. She understood it, that it was with the help of the Lord that she was able to give birth to a child. And we also can see here from this element of Jeremiah here, this, this verse of Jeremiah, um, that he also allows our conception and therefore our creation, because at conception, an, a unique individual is formed. All the rest is a matter of maturity. But he has a purpose for us. And then the question is for us, as we mature, will we discover, understand that purpose? Will we see the gifts and talents that he has placed within us? Will we understand the purpose to which God desires that we put those gifts and talents so that his will may be done? This, this is our challenge in life. And yet, um, we, we sometimes don't understand that. We are kind of like Cain. Well, we're just, we're just driving along, but we don't really think of the ramifications or consequences of our actions. We only see things with blinders on, but we don't see things in the way that, that God does in terms of what is good in his eyes, what is right and just in his eyes. So now if we move forward to Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, it states, Now a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. Seeing what a fine child he was, she hid him for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took a papyrus basket, daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and putting the child in it, placed it among the reeds on the bank of the Nile. His sister stationed herself at a distance to find out what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe at the Nile, while her attendants walked along the bank of the Nile. Noticing the basket among the reeds, she sent her handmaid to fetch it. On opening it, she looked, and there was a baby boy crying. She was moved with pity for him and said, It is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and summon a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter answered her, Go. So the young woman went and called the child's own mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse him for me, and I will pay your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, 
and he became her son. She named him Moses, for she said, I drew him out of the water. So to give full context, in Exodus chapter 1, we observe that the Egyptians became fearful as the Israelite population grew to a significant size. To prevent this growing population, Pharaoh instituted a form of birth control by instructing the midwives to kill all the male children at birth. As we pick up the story, we find a woman unable to protect and care for her son. So in a sense, she left him for adoption. So what came of this adoption, and what might this story reveal to us about the nature of family and the plan of God? Sure would tell us a lot today, wouldn't it? About the, the option of adoption. <laughs> there was a, you know, fear amongst these people, and that they needed to, she wanted to do something to save her baby child. So putting him in the basket and putting him in the river. Then when he got, when he was found, then fortunately she was the one who was asked to take care of this child. And uh, and by adoption, since a midwife did not kill this child, the, and the child was adopted, he grew up in the palace. Yeah. And of course, if we, if we again, if we um, look at the full story here, later on, uh, when Pharaoh questions about mm, how come uh, some of the, the uh, Hebrew male children are surviving, so the midwives respond <coughs> that the Hebrew women are very stout and that they're able to give birth before the midwives can get there. So fortunately in our day, midwives don't uh, kill uh, the, the children. Um, oh, well, but we have others that do. But again, we, we see here that a life has been formed for a very specific purpose. And we also see the effort of the evil one to try to, to um, keep lives from growing to their potential. And we also see that this child who would, should have, by the decree of Pharaoh, been killed at birth, is able to survive and is not only adopted, but then later goes on to lead the Israelites out of slavery. A rather significant role, if you think about it, um, that he went on to do. And so, again, God creates each and every one of us for a purpose. The question is, is will we live up uh, to that responsibility for which he creates us? Well, I think if, uh, you know, there's a cliche that uh, God always thinks good out of evil, no matter what it is, so, you know, even um, even if we have been a child uh, who survived an abortion attempt or somebody who's had an abortion who's healed from that, um, there's always that good. You know, you always think, well, maybe your baby's gone to heaven and is now an intercessor for you now. Or um, no matter what your origin is, even if your parents didn't want you uh, as a child, um, I think that it's always good reason to say that that you essentially come from God, basically, and have a purpose, a dignity, and a vocation in life, and that um, that your origin is basically good and um, so uh, you can overcome no matter what your uh, roots are. And um, it says that God brings a lot of good out of, like Moses. Uh, you know, uh, even the fact that he stuttered. <laughs> he didn't think he would be a particularly good candidate for being prophet. But um, in his origin, even. Uh, but... God uh, often chooses the least of the of the uh, world uh, to make some great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to apologize. We seem to be having some technical difficulties with some feedback with through our line here. I don't want to 
uh, unfortunately, we don't have any way to resolve it, but we'll try to work on that for the future. Um, let's look at Luke chapter 2, verse 26 to 35. And here it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered that sort of greet, what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for I have found, you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have had no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So in this scriptural passage, we observe the enunciation of a very special family to be formed. What was unique about this family, and what ways did God provide for his only begotten son? Well, she, go ahead. Go ahead, Helen. Well, uh, she was betrothed to Joseph, and in that time, and uh, that, at that time, that was essentially a wedding. She was married to him, and um, and Joseph. Uh, Joseph was an amazing man, and he became a stepfather to the Son of God. I think that uh, this, the family shown here with a stepfather, a loving stepfather, and a mother and a child is one of the most beautiful examples and of great help to many families who uh, have either a stepmother or children who have stepmothers or stepfathers on how that kind of family can thrive and grow. And and the, what we what we see through that is, is is that we see the importance of various relationships within the family. We we see the interaction that occurs between father and child and mother and child, and father and mother each have different roles in terms of how a child is raised, how they're influenced, uh, how they are prepared to assume adulthood, and also how they're prepared to live according to the ways of the Lord. And we'll, we'll talk about that here in a little minute. But in this particular case, of course, we, we also look at the fact about how the angel came to Mary, and Mary could have just as easily said, eh, no, I'm not ready to have children, not my time. I'm too young. Um, I've got other things I, I want to do. You know, yeah, I'm betrothed to Joseph, but we, you know, we're, we're planning to wait and all that kind of stuff. Instead, she, she said yes. She said yes to the will of God. And so we have to ask ourselves the question of the meaning of yes to the will of God in our relationship to Christ, the meaning of our yes to the will of God in our relationship to one another, not just within in the immediate family or the biological family, but in the other families we might participate, parish families, the human family. The bond of family here we see is not just about lineage, but about our relationship with God and his son. Something for us to, to think about, family, the most important aspect of it, we, we can say, yes, there's a, there's a very heavy bond it is produced because we're, you know, blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh relationship, there is a, uh, a, a bond that is re established because of lineage. But that's not the only glue that holds it together. Perhaps the more important glue is relationship. And so it's not just a matter of, of relationship with just mother and father and child, but it's also a matter of the relationship with our creator as well. We, we see this very intricate 
uh, web of relationship that goes on here as we continue to wander through Scripture. So um, here's a, another interesting aspect of, of the way to look at this as we start looking at an extended family, if you will. Because if we look, look at Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35, we see, or we're told, his mother, meaning Mary, his mother and his brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. The crowd around him told him, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. But he said to them in reply, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those seated in the circle, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. So here's Jesus, you know, he's taking an opportunity to make a point. <clears throat> that yes, we do have our immediate family, our biological family, if you will. <clears throat> but here he talks about the relationship of everyone with God and how that establishes their relationship with him. That he become that we become part of his family as we do the will of God. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. So as we examine the scripture, and I you know, jumped ahead and should have asked the question first, uh, Jesus declares that whoever does the will of God is my brother and mother, and, or brother and sister and mother. So what does this reveal to us about the nature of Christ's family? He builds families like I do. Wherever you go, he builds a family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say, I'm calling. I'm calling. <laughs> Well, I think it shows up, too, at the cross when traditionally um, uh, Mary would have been given to uh, one of his re blood relatives to care for, but uh, because he, he considers the Apostle John as family, and, and it also shows that he didn't have any other biological relatives, he gave her to John. And so, um, and I think it shows up also in the teachings of, of Paul, uh, probably too many to say uh, about the church as being uh, a family. And often spiritual bonds are more uh, stronger than biological bonds um, because just because of their nature, biological things are um, temporary. Um, but often we can we can uh, be united with our whole family in heaven and the church in purgatory and the church here on earth at, at mass. That's how we encounter the family in entirety. Uh, we can be there with the people who in one family who is passed on. So, um, so in that way, it shows that we are in Christ, all connected, even those who are beyond the, the grave right now. Some people have taken this scripture or have felt uncomfortable with the scripture because the, uh, they might think it implies that Mary uh, was being uh, um, criticized for this. But we always have to go back to the, the very beginning with Mary. She did the will of God. He's not saying that she is not his mother. But she, in my mind, or my way of thinking, he not only accepts her as his biological mother, but in doing the will of God, she was the first, uh, the first to do the will of God in relationship to him. Yeah, yeah I, because I think the same thing. I think he was taking the opportunity to make a point. Is, is that, yes, you can say um, that, that, that these are my relatives out there. And, of course, we have to understand that the, um, the language at the time used the term brothers and sisters to also include uh, cousins and, and, you know, um, yeah, they, in a variety of I don't, capacities. Even, I don't think they even had a word for brother. It, it, it was kinsmen in all regards because cousins were – considered as close as brothers and sisters in a in a clan of, of that nature. Right. 
And, and that's also why I think we see the the brackets in the um, <clears throat> in the scripture when it says and your sisters, because kinsmen would include both brother and sister. And then later he clarifies my brother and sister and mother. Um, you know, he, he puts this all together. But I think he was just taking the opportunity. This is we're a greater family based upon our relationship with God. So we, you know, lineage is kind of our first link, our first relationship. Uh, our blood, our DNA is our first relationship, but it's ultimately the relationship of love that we establish with one another that really brings us together as family, and that's why we can eventually become parish families or even the human family. So if we um, look at Ephesians chapter 5, and this is where I'm really going to step in the muck, um, is uh, verses uh, 21 to 31. It reads... Be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife just as Christ is head of the church. He himself the Savior of the body. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her to sanctify her cleansing her by the bath of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle, wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So also husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his wife, his father, and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. <clears throat> so, in our modern day, there is perhaps no other segment of scripture which gives priests more consternation than when the, the passage on husband and wives comes up during the mass reading. And the word which stirs the passions of the politically correct, perhaps more than anything else, is the word subordinate. It kind of stops them in their tracks, and I think it stops them from reading further and seeing the full context of what's being said here. So if we look at the full context, however, what are we being told here about the relationship of man and woman in marriage? Well, it starts out with be subordinate to one another out of reverence for Christ. And... Uh, Another way is wives should respect their husbands. Uh, but there is nothing in this that uh, gives excuse for men to be uh, anything but respectful. Well, I think uh, it's, um, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's it's giving a complementary uh, relationship here is that, uh, you know, while uh, the woman respects the husband, at the same time, the husband is supposed to love his wife as his own flesh. And obviously you're not going to abuse or disregard your own flesh. So, and the whole nature of love is a self-giving to the other. It's a, it's a relationship of uh, listening to each other and trying to please each other rather than imposing our own will or our own uh, desires upon another uh, forcefully. So um, so I think that's the whole uh, gist of what's being taught here is that um, it doesn't give a husband the right to order his wife around like a servant. And I think, unfortunately, um, in some Christian circles, um, that has been uh, true. I remember somebody um, that my parents visited, the, the wife had to ask permission to join in the conversation. Well, I think that... Um, that uh, that, uh, you know, respecting and understanding that that your spouse is a human person with dignity as well. Because here at the base here is out of reverence for Christ. So 
we have to see the other person as a temple of the indwelling Christ and it has dignity. So um, I think that has to be a cornerstone. And, um, and so any kind of abuse or uh, domination, I think especially as Catholics were blessed to have Mary in the Holy Family because uh, she was very specially endowed by God, and it only reinforces the belief that that women um, are uh, capable uh, and um, are to be respected and, and honored. So, um, so I think Mary in this situation is a very good example as well in in the whole uh, um, holy family. I think this is one of those areas where context matters because, yeah, we can stir up a hornet's nest by taking verse 22 out of context. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands. If we stop right there, well, yeah, the fight is on. But see how it finishes as to the Lord. Now, now think of this here for a moment. When Jesus... Um, at, after his resurrection, came to Peter and says, do you love me? Well, it's the same question to the wife in relationship to Christ. Do you love me? Well, let's go, let's go ask what that question love is all about. Because later on we see that, that the husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for you, for her. In other words, notice we keep getting brought back to Christ in this uh, in this advice that is that uh, <clears throat> Saint uh, Paul is giving to the Ephesians. Well, I have a question. Sure. We talked in previous um, sessions about the meaning of words. Words don't mean the same day as they meant then. Um, and how are people when they read books, how we talk when they read books that are written in today's language? In a hundred years, are they going to understand because language moves? My question would be, what did the word subordinate mean at that time? And, and that is a bit of a challenge um, because you also have to look at how did it translate from the Greek. Because the other, the other area that I would recommend that we look at is the word love. What does it mean for husbands to love their wives? And this is why you have to look at the full context of Scripture. We can go to when uh, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And he says, tend my lambs, feed my sheep. And, and says, says basically that three times when, when Peter finally gets exaggerated, yes, Lord, I love you, you know that. I mean, if you're, you're the one that knows everything. However, when we come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7, he explains love. Now, to explain this in the footnotes, it says, in Greek, there are 15 verbs for love. And in English, the tendency is, is to um, define those with adjectives. And so that's kind of almost what we see laid out here. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It is not pompous. It is not inflated. It is not rude. It does not seek its own interests. It is not quick-tempered. It does not brood over injury. It does not rejoice over wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So when husbands love your wives, they kind of have to go back to here and look at what that love actually means. Well, let's put it into an even greater context. In 1 John chapter uh, 5, I'm sorry, in John um, well, I, 15. I got 15. 15, I think it was 15, verse 13. I kind of got the, I, I, I screwed up here when I tried to make the annotation. Anyway, it says, no one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. In other words, if we're looking at what's being asked of the husband here, it's just that basically he's putting his life on his line for his wife. So when it starts off, be subordinate to one another out of reverence of Christ, that's what love is, is the subordination of our personal selfishness and desires to the needs of the other. And that's what we should be looking at in terms of this scripture here 
It's not a power relationship. It's a partnership relationship, and we're both being called to love one another uh, within that context of matrimony. In Mark chapter 9, verses 33 to 37, it says, They came to Capernaum, and once inside the house, he began to ask them, What are you arguing about on the way? But they remained silent. They had been discussing among themselves on the way who was the greatest. Then he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone wishes to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. Taking the child, he placed it in their midst, and putting his arms around it, he said to them, Whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but the one who sent me. So here again, we, we see another example. You know, we can think, our, think of, well, this, this says here, wife should be subordinate to me, and that will be your first and, and worst mistake. Because, again, what Jesus told us is, is if you're in this position, you then are the servant of all. So this concept of servant leadership, Christ demonstrated to us in many ways, but the most important way that he demonstrated it to us was from a, on top of, of the cross. And so we see that basically a very significant responsibility is placed upon husbands to love their wives. But it starts off with each of them should be for the other. Something, again, for us to think about our relationships, if we're constantly putting our desires first, our relationships are likely to suffer. But if we consider the, the needs of the other before our own needs, then our relationships are probably going to be tied together a little bit easier. And since I'm very quickly running out of time here, I'm going to talk real quickly about um, children because it says, children, obey your parents and everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children so they may not become discouraged. And as we consider this scripture, most parents will give a resounding cheer for the first verse, children, obey your parents and everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. But then we have to look at the second one, fathers, do not provoke your children. Uh, so they may not become discouraged. And we may ask ourselves, well, what is the meaning of this? And we can see this extended a little bit further in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, where it says, Children, obey your parents. In the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may have a long life on earth. And then it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up with the training and instruction of the Lord. So basically what it means is, is that, again, it's about a matter of relationship of parents with their children. And it's a relationship that requires um, talking and understanding. And sometimes, yes, children, because they don't have the knowledge that their parents do, um, need to obey their parents. And certainly throughout their life, they need to honor their father, father and mother. But there is a responsibility of parents to raise their children with the training and instruction of the Lord. And so, um, some final thoughts. Today we talked about a special ministry, and that is the care of one another and family. As we began our discussion, we identified that while a family is the basic unit of society and is traditionally a result of man and woman in matrimony raising their children, there are also variants such as single parents and adopted families. We also observed how we're all one extended family, not just by our lineage from Adam and Eve, but by our relationship with God. As St. John Paul II reminded us, the family is a little domestic church. Within this church, we are called to learn, share, and live our faith. Parents are called to teach their children, and children are called to learn from their parents. As we look to the example of Christ, the key to blessings in our family relationships is not found in our personal desires or our selfishness, but by subordinating our desires so we may better share the blessings of love within our family. Family relationships can be the best of times, and they can be the worst of times. We are blessed when our families are able to sail the calm seas. We're even more blessed when the bond of family survives the storms. For what is revealed in such times is the strength of the bond of love. If we struggle in a storm, let us pray that God will guide us through and heal any wounds of the heart. I pray every married couple shall receive the wisdom, courage, and strength to which the family, which has begun through their matrimony, will thrive through the blessings of love. I pray every parent will see the blessing God has given them through their children. 
I pray every parent will live up to the trust God places within them to receive that gift and the responsibility to teach and raise their children in the ways of the Lord. I pray every child will not only receive and enjoy the love of their mother and father, but will also share in the blessings of returning that love. To share in love is not always easy in this world. Indeed, the love to which we are called requires sacrifice and work. But if we allow, love will prepare us for the world to come. And so as you can hear in the clock in the background, uh, our time's come to an end. We hope you'll be able to join us again next week as we pick up our discussion with a call to give and receive forgiveness. So let us conclude with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may put on the armor of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you all, and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.